Hello and welcome to Live Wire Markets. My name is Chris Conway. Today I'm joined by Sam Reynolds. Sam is the CEO of Octopus Investments Australia and he joins us as part of Livewire's Undiscovered Fund Series for 2024. Sam, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for having me again. Of course. Now, last time we spoke, Sam, we talked about Oreo, which is one of the funds that you run. We're here today to talk about Oasis. Can you just let everyone know how it differs and what your uh, target objective is for that fund? The main difference is Oasis has development exposure. So development is the early stage of a life cycle of a renewable energy asset. So that's when you're organising the land, uh, planning approval and access to grid. So high risk part of the life cycle. Uh, so Oasis comes with uh, higher returns, uh, but also some tighter liquidity uh, compared to Oreo, which is, Oreo is more into operational uh, assets. So just to clarify, so Oasis is, uh, you're, being, you're rewarding investors for taking on that earlier stage risk and that's the benefit that they get at the other end, yeah. Exactly, so Oreo returns, you're looking at it's a seven, eight yep. percent. Oasis returns a, a 10 to 14 percent net returns. So higher returning uh, product. Big institutions really like Oasis because it, it, the, the pipeline that development has gives them an idea of their deployment over the next five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the big wholesale investors also we're interested in that and, and the higher returns. So that's why we bought the product out for, for wholesale investors. And just in terms of time frame, Sam, is there is there an ideal time frame that uh, an investment in Oasis would run? We've got a number of assets. So there's about 10 assets in there at the moment. Okay. Uh, two are operational, then, a, then another eight that are in different stages of development. Yep. So the first assets that'll come out of development into construction will be at the end of this year. There's no time, so as you as you come into the, those uh, that investment, uh, you get the uplift as those assets come from development into construction because they've effectively been de-risks. Yep. Uh, you also get another uplift in your returns when the assets go from construction to operation. So, and that is happening consistently over the next five years. So, uh, any time is a good time to come in. Yeah. Sounds good, Sam. Again, last time we spoke, to, we talk about the we talked about the challenges of the grid and the lumpiness of renewable energy development here in Australia. What's changed since then? Has there been any positive developments? What does it look like? Yeah, look, the grid has always been a challenge. Uh, so what happened, uh, we had a big onslaught of uh, renewable energy projects hit the grid uh, 2017, 2018, 2019. And the energy market operator, AEMO, was really uh, sort of coming to terms what the impact of all that was going to be on the grid, how to look at the connection process. Uh, but now AEMO's had for four or five years to, to get under the skin of those issues. They've got a massive team now that looks at connection. This is sort of happening in other global markets now, uh, the US, but AEMO's are, are probably five years in advance of those other markets on how to make these connections happen quicker. Uh, so look, we're a lot more comfortable with the, the grid uh, than where we were maybe four or five years ago. So there is some positivity coming and Australia has learnt some of its lessons over the last five years, which is great for investors. Great. Sam, the goal of the fund is building a diverse, multi-state, multi-technology portfolio of Australian renewable energy assets. Can you talk through what exactly that looks like? Maybe one or two projects that hi highlight that, uh, that strategy. Yeah, so we've got a, a very big wind farm in, uh, in southern Queensland called Derlaka. Uh, that's operational. Uh, we like wind in Queensland because it's uncorrelated to solar uh, in the middle of the day. This actually wind farm generates at night. Uh, we've got a big solar farm in New South Wales. We see New South Wales as a key market for us. Uh, our assets that we'll be investing into this year will be a big storage, so big battery and solar project just outside of Canberra. Uh, and then a big solar and uh, storage project just in uh, Victoria, in Gippsland. So, and then we've got a pipeline of wind, solar and storage in the key markets, which is Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. They're the key, key target markets, the biggest markets uh, in the national energy market. Sam, you sort of touched on it there. Um, those investments that you're making, they include those in development, construction, and those that are fully operational, the, the whole spectrum. How do you determine the mix? Is it a matter of the pieces fitting together or is it more as the opportunities come across your desk, you just assess them on their merits and then invest accordingly? It's not as easy as going to a supermarket and choosing the right mix off the shelf. So you do need a, a big portfolio of assets. That's just why we have a development book that we like to uh, have lots of assets coming through the different stages of the life cycle. Uh, what we do have is a big energy markets and technology team. So this is a team of four people that is looking at the data and analytics behind how we structure our portfolio. So what is the right mix of wind solar storage on different in different states? Uh, what we want is our portfolio to look like the future of energy in Australia. Yep. 
And what you need to really uh, underpin that is really strong data. Where on the grid, uh, different weather patterns, very big country, different weather patterns mean a lot in the energy, in the energy space. Uh, what's happening with supply and demand? Uh, we've got some big coal-fired power stations coming off, uh, Araring in New South Wales and your lawn uh, in Victoria. Uh, Araring and your lawn look after about 20% each of those states. That is going to put demand, extra demand. What's the pricing going to do? So all that data comes into how we select those assets in our portfolio. And in terms of that data, you said you've got a team now of four, I think it is. Is that all data that you collect yourselves or are you relying on external data as well to colour the picture, shall we say? Yeah, definitely. So we, we'll, get, we'll get data from lots of different parts. Uh, obviously, weather data, uh, data in regard to what's happening on the grid. Um, what, what this team does is put it into a usable form so that our investment and origination team can, can use it when they're making investment decisions. Uh, the other thing they'll do is when we're selling the electricity, so which is via power purchase agreement to the end customer, they'll help us structure those power purchase products. So all of our assets have a 60, 70% fixed price contract so that you're underpinning the revenues for, for a long time, usually 10 to 15 years. And that, that team helps with structuring and pricing uh, those, those revenues to ensure uh, the returns that we're, we're promising investors are as stable as they can be. Sam, a question without notice. In terms of the modelling, right? Um, climate change, uh, things are changing fast, dramatically around the globe. How does that impact the models that these guys are putting together and the future demand? The key one is weather. Uh, so weather by 2030, 50% of the global energy price will be determined by weather. Right. Now that is a, so you need to understand weather and not, ne not necessarily just because you're in the energy industry. Uh, if you're in infrastructure, manufacturing, uh, agriculture, agriculture yeah. uh, food, and everything uh, weather is going to be a big impact because it's going to impact your energy costs. Yeah. So where, where you're used to looking at a, a coal-fired power station, you needed to increase the capacity of that facility. You'd put a new turbine on that, 20% bigger. You'd look at the, the logistics, increase the mine by 20%. Now that's, now that's weather determined. You could have a very good year uh, with weather, you could have a very bad year, and that can, that can turn uh, pricing quite materially. So that data team is really a big part of that is looking at the, the weather in the future. Sam, in January this year, Zenith Investment Partners assigned recommended ratings to Octopus Australia funds, the first and only rating Zenith have provided to renewable energy funds. And you also recently received an investment grade rating from Frontier Advisors. For newer funds like this one, these designations are particularly important. Um, can you just talk to how you went about earning those those uh, those designations? Yeah, yeah definitely. Look, look, both premier consulting firms, uh, Zenith and Frontier, Frontier to the big institutions and Zenith to, to more to wholesale. But uh, look, a long time coming. Uh, it took us three years to, to get them comfortable with our strategy. They did a lot of work behind the scenes to understand the strategy, understand the team, uh, the governance, uh, the culture of the, the company as well. Uh, it's really important. They're protecting their brand as well and their customers. Yeah. Uh, but I think one of the things they really like, they see a lot of renewable energy players, not just locally, but around the world. Uh, one thing they liked about us was our differentiated strategy. Right. So how we, how we work with our customers, how we're giving double digit returns back to our investors. Uh, and that's something that they haven't seen from other global uh, renewable energy players that they've reviewed. Sam, it's one thing to get uh, some nice ratings from, uh, from these guys, but then money talks, right? The fund boasts institutional investors, including Host Plus, REST, the Australian Federal Government via CEFC and a UK pension fund. Why are these types of investors so important for the ongoing success? Yeah, definitely. Look, big institutional investors, they really like uh, renewable energy asset class. Yeah. Uh, it's a long-term yielding uh, product for them. They love infra infrastructure. It balances out their, their equity book. Uh, so these big institutions are looking at their long-term yielding and the, and the returns, the double-digit returns. Uh, we want them to look at it and put it alongside other infrastructure. Uh, we don't want them to sacrifice returns for the green angle or for net zero. This should be seen exactly along other infrastructure that we're investing into, whether it's gas pipelines or toll roads or airports. Uh, and that's how, we, that's how we've sold the product into these big institutions. Sam, thanks again for joining us for LiveWise Undiscovered series. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed that interview as much as I did, make sure to give it a like and don't forget to follow our YouTube channel because we're adding lots of great content every single week. <laughs>